Ever feel like you're doing this teaching thing alone? You don't have to be. Share Teaching is all about sharing the workload through the power of collaboration and teamwork. Together, we'll walk through all the difficult parts of teaching and learn how to streamline our processes, fine tune our time management, and develop a more manageable workload. If that sounds like a dream come true to you, then welcome to the Shared Teaching Podcast. Let's share in the teaching to make those dreams a reality. Now here's today's Shared Teaching. Welcome back to the Shared Teaching Podcast. I'm your host, Susan, the creator and founder behind Shared Teaching. Thank you so much for being here. I would love for this to be a place where we collaborate. So if you ever have any great ideas for a podcast episode, make sure to reach out to me, Susan at sharedteaching.com, and I will make sure that we record an episode on that. By we, I mean I, because I'm a team of one. (laughs) Sometimes my daughter helps, so it is kind of a we. But anyway, this is episode number 95, where I'm talking about best advice for new teachers in the fall. And if you missed the summer edition, which I recorded in June, you're going to want to check out episode number 77, yeah, 77, (laughs) where I talk about the best advice for new teachers, the summer edition. So if you're still in your summer break, I am so jealous, but go ahead and listen to that episode about what you should be preparing for before you actually start with the kiddos. And this episode, the fall edition, is what happens once you've started. So I know being a new teacher is incredibly challenging, so I would love to be a source of support for you. And the first thing I want to talk about is focus on building student relationships. So it's back to school season. The moment you meet your new students, you want to work on building relationships. Students are going to care and put in more effort in school if a teacher cares about them or if they feel like you care about them. Sometimes they might not know if you didn't show it in a way that aligns with their love language. Now, the first way you can build a good relationship is to learn their name. It seems so simple, doesn't it? But please make sure to make an effort. And I try to do this, but I'm horrible sometimes because I am very forgetful. But I like to learn how to pronounce their first and last name. So their whole name But I also like to ask them if they have a nickname they prefer. And if it's an appropriate nickname, then I will call them that during school times, if I feel so inclined. Otherwise, I will just go by whatever name, first names on the roster, right? So sometimes, especially last year, I had some interesting nicknames that I refused to call these students because they would have been very embarrassing for them in a class of their peers. So make sure if you're asking them the nickname, maybe make it a little one-on-one conversation in case it is a nickname that you don't think might be super appropriate or that they'll get made fun of. Okay. So I like to make myself a little cheat sheet when I'm asking students their names by writing how to say their name phonetically on just a blank roster, and I keep it near me while I'm teaching throughout the first few weeks of school. So I can refer to it, I can look at it, and I know that that I'm saying their name correctly. I also always tell students right up front, I'm so sorry, I have a hard time with names. Please forgive me if I mispronounce your name or I call you a different name. Please correct me because second and first graders might not want to speak up and tell you that you're wrong. And you don't want to end up the whole year saying someone's name the wrong way. My daughter, for example, goes by Evie, but she has a friend that's been a friend since kindergarten and she keeps calling her Evie. And my daughter is too polite to correct her. And now it's been years, years, folks. So she just lets her friend call her the wrong name. But she's okay with it. Some kids will not be. So just putting that out there. Now, another way to show students that you care to spend time with them is asking them non-education related questions. So my favorite way to do this is a five minute moment called good things. And I've talked about this before on the podcast and I've written about it on the blog. So if you want to listen to that, 
you want to go to classroom management quick wins and it is tip number four so it's at the end of the podcast episode number 41 and I will try to link that in the show notes for you as well so good things is something that's done at the beginning or the end of the school day and students are randomly picked to share a good thing from the day And it can be super simple. And I emphasize this as well, especially if your friends have a hard time finding something that they think might be good. Because maybe good to them is like a trip to Disneyland, but you don't get that every day. So it's about finding those moments, those small moments within our days that make us feel good about ourselves. And just sharing them out and hearing others helps them find them more easily, and also gives them something positive to focus on in their day. And I love that it's a way to get to know my students because a lot of times they'll tell me about something that happened over the weekend or they played with a cousin or a brother, and it just gets me to know them in a little bit different way than just strictly academically. So other students, once the person has shared their good thing, are invited to ask additional questions, and then the student that had shared originally is celebrated. So again, you want to look at Classroom Management Quick Wins, episode number, what did I say, 71? See, I forgot already. Okay, so moving on to the next piece of advice, and that is to create family and staff relationships. So your students come first, and then you want to get to know your coworkers and your students' families. Now, just like your students, you want to know your coworkers' names and their position at the school. You never know when you might need their help or advice, especially like maybe the school counselor, the staff psychologist, even the front office personnel, or even if a fifth grade teacher maybe. Maybe you teach first grade and you think, I'll never need to talk to a fifth grade teacher. But maybe you will because they have an older sibling in their class or maybe they host an after-school program and you need to ask them something about the after-school clubs. So it's important to just smile, be friendly. I'm not saying to go over the top, but a little goes a long way. Because trust me, my friend and I often talk about this, about how sometimes newer teachers, they do not make the time to kind of be friendly and get to know everybody. So make sure to do what you would do with your students, but do it with your coworkers. Okay, so some of the most important relationships in your school building, and you might have heard this already, is the office and the custodial staff. I like to visit the office every morning just because I love the ladies in there. There's three of them, and they're just always so friendly. And I've noticed... The more friendly I am, the more we kind of like chit chat off topic, the more inclined they are to kind of do me a favor once in a while, right? And it can be something really little, like, or it could be something really big. Like last year, (laughs) the office register, so the lady that takes in all the new coming registrations, She likes me, luckily, and she noticed my class was getting really full. She knew I had quite a few handfuls in that class that were just a little bit more difficult than others. Actually, no, I think that was the year before last. See, they all start blending together after a while. So a couple years ago, but anyway, it doesn't really matter. But she saw a new enrollment student come in, and she opted not to place them in my classroom, and she made a point to tell me about it later so that I knew she had done me that little favor. So you never know, you might get a little extra perk just by saying hi and good morning and how was your day yesterday? You know, small talk never gets too old, right? Okay, so now during really stressful times, and this might be something that not everyone wants to do and I understand, but it might be nice to offer some kind of small treat for the office staff. It could be just like a basket of small candies that you want to drop off for them so that you can they can just snack throughout the day and have like a chocolate boost or something. Or maybe you want to buy them a coffee because you're getting one. Just simple things can really help boost the morale of the office staff because they have it hard too. 
They are working just as hard as the teachers. I know because my sister was in that position for many years, and she ran around like a chicken with her head cut off, and I don't even know how she survives sometimes, but treat your office staff well because they will remember it. Trust me. Okay, so now during the school year, I like to help the custodial staff as well in small ways. Now, every single day, I place the trash cans from my classroom very close to the door so they can just open the door and empty them because there's a lot of times there's only one person on duty every night and just taking those extra steps to go across my room and grab the trash can and bring it back over to where they're emptying it and then put it back again takes a lot of minutes off of their time and they have the rest of the school that they have to do that to and clean as well. So that's just something little that I do for them. It doesn't take me much time because I'm on my way out the door and I just take it over with me and then they can empty it from the door. Now, sometimes there are also only specific days they vacuum because again, we're very short staffed a lot of the years where we might have one person on duty and they can't vacuum every single classroom every single night with the other duties they have. So we have specific days that they vacuum. So I like to stack the chairs on those days because then they don't have to do it and it's easier for them to get around for the vacuum. If there's a lot of papers on the floor, my kids and I clean it up before we leave because I also am trying to teach my students cleanliness of their environment and just pride in their classroom so we try to do like a little quick clean before we leave so it's not a disaster when someone comes in later to help clean it up and they appreciate that they'll do things like find me extra boxes at the end of the year when I need to pack up my classroom or if I have something that's broken they'll be right there to fix it a little bit more quicker sometimes than other people so Again, making that effort. And then getting to know families. Of course, you want to reach out to every family with a positive note or phone call within the first week of school. I know that sounds overwhelming and very challenging, but think of it as five families a day. Shoot off a quick email. Make a quick phone call. Sometimes I want to talk forever, but you can make it sound like, oh, hey, I have another appointment coming up. I got to go. And then you gently hang up. So um, if a phone call is not your thing, maybe try an email, make it personal. And then after that first week, you're going to want to try to repeat that effort of a note or phone call at least once a month. So they're not always hearing the negative. And that goes a long way to get some of the parents on your side. You also want to make sure you have some kind of communication plan with families. So you know how you're going to communicate with them, how often, and start that communication early. Things like the special schedule or the homework procedures are things that families would like to know within the first week of school. Because believe me, as a parent, I'm asking already, like, hey, what special do you have today? And what happened to your homework? Like, do you have any? And my daughter's telling me, like, no. And I'm like, "Mm, she's already in fourth grade, right? So she's old enough to be pretty self-reliant. But at the same time, I think that sounds weird. So I question it. So I would like to hear from this, her teacher as well to kind of verify that. And I haven't heard anything yet. So I, as a parent that works with the teacher at the same school, is kind of like, hmm. So keep parents on your good side. Make sure to communicate all of those kind of things that you think they might know about or Johnny's going to go home and tell mom about. But mom might want some verification from you. So Think of that when you're putting together what you tell parents. Okay, so another piece of advice for the fall is you want to learn who your students are academically. Now, back to school season is notorious for teachers wanting to peek at other people's rosters. Retaining teachers are always curious where their last year's students ended up. Right, You always want to know who has this student or where did that student go or, oh my gosh, they were my favorite and now you're, they're in your class. You're going to love them. Right, You hear all of those comments at Back to School, but you also get the unsolicited advice about those students. So I'm a teacher that doesn't want to know about the student before I meet the student. So as a new teacher, this can be kind of challenging and maybe intimidating 
when faced with a veteran teacher and they're trying to tell you all about this student that they had and how naughty they were and nothing worked and their parents were a nightmare and you just don't want to hear it. So how do you shut that down in a nice way? So I would just say if they ask to see your list before you even give it to them, you're going to tell them, please don't tell me anything about my students. I love to form my own opinions first. And then if I have any questions, I'll come and ask you about them. And most teachers will respect that. And then they're not going to tell you all about the things that the student did or did not do in their room last year. Hopefully. There's always those teachers that will tell you anyway. But I feel like most teachers will be pretty respectful of the fact that you tell them, wait, no, I I don't want to know anything. I will seek you later once I meet them and ask you questions. So the beginning of the year is also marked with assessing And there's a lot of assessing that you have to do. Depending on what your grade level is, you might have a little bit more than others. I know when I taught first and second grade, I feel like I spent nothing but assessing the first several weeks just so that I could figure out and form my small groups. So your school or your school district might have particular assessments for you to do. So you don't want to be afraid to ask about what the outcome of the assessments will be. They might be used in place of an assessment you had already planned to do, and you can just swap it out for your district assigned one. That's going to save you some time to just do the one. Now, my go-to assessments, if you don't have any clue what you should be assessing on, (laughs) are a sight word assessment. So I ask them to both read and spell the words. I prefer the Dolch sight word list, but some teachers prefer fries. Some schools have their own list. So this is one you might have to ask around. And if nobody has a list, then you choose your favorite. Now, I do the sight word assessment, and then I also do a spelling inventory. And this comes from Words Their Way, which I talked about before. And it's required by my school district, but I also use the data to form my word study groups. So it's important if you are giving these assessments and taking all this time to assess the students that you're actually using the data that you're getting from it. Then I like to do a running record, and sometimes this is replaced by an oral reading fluency passage just because it's faster to do a one-minute reading with each student, and then I can get a really good idea if they're trying to read a benchmark fluency passage if they can or cannot read and where their skill level is based on how many words a minute they're reading in that passage. So last year I moved away from the running records just because they're so involved and lengthy sometimes and I moved into the oral reading fluency passage. But I still believe highly in running records. They're very, very valuable. So don't be afraid to do them just because I stopped doing them for one year. And then the last is a phonics screener, which is also required by my district. So again, my assessments, and this was for second grade, and I also did the same thing with first grades, is a sight word assessment to read and to spell the words, a spelling inventory from words their way, a oral reading fluency passage or running record, one or the other, don't do both, and then a phonics screener. So all of these assessments can take several weeks to get through a whole class, which brings me to my next advice to spread out the assessments. The kids will get tired and you will get tired. So I like to do pieces of the phonics screener, for example, to break up that monotony because giving the same assessment over and over can be pretty draining. Our phonics screener is several pages long, so I just test the alphabet letters and sounds, and then I go through the whole class one student at a time. So I'll call up the first student, we'll just do the alphabet letters and sounds, I send them back to their desk, I call up the next student, they do the alphabet letters and sounds, and so on and so forth until the whole class is tested on just the alphabet letters and sounds. And then I move to the next section on the phonics screener. I personally feel like doing it this way goes quicker, but... Other teachers swear by just keeping one student and doing the whole screener. I, I don't know. It's your preference if you think you'll go better for you to do one child at a time or if you want to just do section by section. It's whatever works for you because in the end, all have to be completed anyway, right? So it doesn't really matter how you get there. Okay, so after your assessments are done, you don't want to forget to use the data like I mentioned a minute ago. 
I like to keep a spreadsheet of all the data. So um, a lot of times I'll just print out a blank roster from our grading program. And then I will just write what the assessment is across the top. And then I write their scores going across by their names. Hopefully that makes sense. So just a little quick spreadsheet that I make for myself so I have all the data in one spot. This helps me look for trends within my classroom like, oh, 90% of my students had trouble with the alphabet sounds. Maybe that's something I'm going to do every morning for a review, especially if I'm teaching second grade. I need to get that solid, right? And it also helps me look for trends for just an individual student. So I can look across their name and see, are they low across all the assessments? Is it just one in particular they struggled with? And then maybe additional assessments are needed, or maybe I just need to pull them in a one-one to group. Maybe they're going to be an ideal intervention candidate. The data is going to tell me all these different things. So it's very important to have it. Now, my next my, my next and my last part of advice is going to be finding a school friend or a mentor, which I know might be easier said than done. Now, if you're lucky, your admin might assign you a mentor as a new teacher. If you're not lucky, you're going to have to seek one out on your own. So look for teachers that will make eye contact with you and say hi. They're friendly. They're approachable. If you have a jam at the copier, they're the ones that are going to be willing to help you out and figure out what's wrong. These are the teachers you're going to find again if you have questions about something. Now, don't bombard them all the time. Maybe have a little list of a few questions you want to ask them at once instead of coming and asking them one question separately all throughout the week, right? Does that make sense? And then another good way to find a mentor is through the support of using a Facebook group. So I work in a large school district, and I was able to find several Facebook groups that are specific to my district by typing in the district name. Now, if you work in a smaller district, you can find many, many Facebook groups that are grade level specific, and you can just join them instead of a school specific site. So I want to know, did I cover anything that you think should have more information or did I leave something out that new teachers really need to know? These are just the basics for the beginning of the school year for fall. I will do another roundup of these later in the school year as we get to our next season. But thank you so much for listening. I hope your school year starts off with a great vibe and is a wonderful beginning of the start of your school year. So thank you so much for listening. I will talk to you soon. Bye for now. If you've loved this show, then join me in sharing the teaching, hitting that subscribe button, and leaving us a review on iTunes so we can be found by more teachers like you who are ready to start sharing the workload. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Find new episodes each week on shareteaching.com. Thanks for listening to the Share Teaching Podcast.